Hello to everybody and uh, thanks for, for being here. Um, to begin, I just wanted to, to share with you a short anecdote uh, because when the negotiation of the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership uh, were launched, I was in charge of uh, the coordination of the French Civil Society Coalition Against Tax Avoidance. And I remember very well uh, the very first time that I was alerted about those negotiations. Uh, it was when we realized with uh, other members of uh, the Tax Justice Network that uh, European financial institution, and in this case, uh, in particular, the Luxembourg ones, were considering how to use such agreement in order to challenge the new rules against tax evasion that, were just, that have just been adopted in the US in 2010 under the law called FATCA. So this is when I started to understand what, what, as, what was at stake with TTIP and how serious it was. So I wanted to, to say uh, this is uh, not the first report on uh, financial uh, services and trade agreement. A few analyses were already published uh, by Finance Watch and some of its members. Uh, including SOMO, the Belgium Trade Union, CNE, and the consumer organization, Buck. Uh, public citizen in the US also uh, wrote about uh, TTIP negotiation and uh, financial services. And uh, in addition, there are quite comprehensive reports by the European Parliament. But in our view, this issue hasn't been sufficiently broadly raised uh, in the public debate. And this is uh, uh, why this report is an attempt to bring together all these analyses and to, to build a transversal analysis based on the most important agreement and the preparation and to make it as accessible as possible. 10 years after the, the financial crisis, we, we think that uh, we need to hold the EU responsible for its strong push in favor of further financial services liberalization through its trade policy. So the inclusion of financial services in trade agreement is not something new. The general agreement on trade in services in 1994 in the World Trade Organization was already covering financial services in order to enhance trade in this sector and to remove regulatory barriers. But the outcomes were not as broad as expected by the EU and uh, its main trade partners. So this is why they decided to, to push in order to bring back this issue in bilateral negotiation with the main economies in the world, the US, Canada, Japan, and also in a plurilateral framework through the TISA negotiation, which involved 22 other countries in addition uh, of uh, the EU member states. And in this context, Brexit negotiation about the future trade relationship between the EU and the UK will also start soon and the financial services are a big piece of it. But here it works the other way, if we can say, um, because we start with a common market and common rules on many aspects. And the question is how much market access do we keep knowing that regulation will diverge in the future? So all this movement raises uh, many issues. First of all, I would like to say that um, the, the rationale for this negotiation shows clearly that the lessons from the last financial crisis haven't been learned by the EU and its trade negotiators. Um, first of all, an assessment of the impact of past rounds of liberalization of financial services and the role they played uh, in increasing the risks and the instability should how should be conducted before any further liberalization is engaged. So in our view, the very idea of including financial services in these trade agreements with a specific objective to keep increasing production and exchange volumes in these sectors goes against the lessons learned from the last global financial crisis. This objective can be questioned on two grounds. First, the economic benefits of the expansion of the financial sector and financial globalization are intensely debated. And second, these alleged benefits must be weighed against potential negative effects. Indeed, the inclusion of financial services in, uh, in those agreements 
could lead to increased financial risk taking and facilitate the propagation of future crises, while at the same time reducing the political space for states to respond to such crises. So right after the financial crisis, the report of the UN Commission of, of Experts on Reform of the International Monetary and Financial System in 2009 clearly pointed out the responsibility of trade policy. It stated that the framework that the many bilateral and regional trade agreements contain commitments that restrict the ability of countries to respond to the current crisis with appropriate regulatory, structural, and macroeconomic reforms and support packages. And it called, therefore, for a review of existing trade agreements. He said all trade agreements need to be reviewed to ensure that they are consistent with the need for an inclusive and comprehensive international regulatory framework, which is conducive to crisis prevention and management, counter-cyclical and prudential safeguards, development and inclusive finance. But on the contrary, EU countries have chosen to pursue the EU trade policy and to go further in opening up financial services through the preparation of numerous bilateral agreement with the main economies in the world. So you can see in the screen all the, the EU trade negotiation currently going on with many, well, with um, almost all the, the countries in the world. Um, of course, the promotion of international financial stability is included in the current negotiation mandates of this trade agreement, but it does not rise to the level of a priority. And even when the focus is on regulatory cooperation, the primary mission of the negotiator, of the trade negotiator, remains facilitating trade and investment flows. And for instance, nothing is said about how to improve the cooperation on supervision. So if it seems indeed beneficial to harmonize rules uh, at an international level, the main objective should be the maximization of protection and not the ma maximization of flows. And in addition, such discussion about harmonization should take place on a multilateral basis in the existing specialized international fora. This is why we think that it's paradoxical to assign the task to trade negotiator in bilateral agreements. So to sum up the current strategy, uh, we, we think that this strategy puts in danger the rules, however insufficient, that have been adopted in the aftermath of the 2007 and 2008 financial crisis. Because such rules are presented now by, by in financial institutions and trade negotiators as trade buyers that should be restricted or simply suppressed. And it locks also countries in a situation where becomes very hard to adopt new financial regulation in order to make finance serve the economy and the society. This is why Stiglitz said in 2014 about TTIP, cooperation everywhere may well agree that getting rid of regulation would be good for corporate profits. Trade negotiators might be persuaded that these trade agreements would be good for trade and corporate profit, but there would be some big loser, namely the rest of us. Indeed, financial sector is clearly identified as an offensive interest for the EU. And uh, member states of the European Union are the primary importers and exporters of financial services. They have a significant trade surplus with the rest of the world in this domain, 36 billion euros in 2013. So this is why the EU um, is uh, so willing to, to include this uh, financial sector in, in, in this negotiation. And the financial industry is also actively involved in the discussion. They have listed all the financial regulation that they would like to undercut or even better remove. This is what I call their letter to Santa Claus. So here are a few examples. Um, for instance, public citizens showed uh, that during TTIP negotiation, the Association of German Banks complained about the implementation of the Dodd-Frank Act, in particular the extraterritorial impact of the Volcker Rule. 
And the European Services Forum also declared that TTIP should prevent American regulators from strengthening rules on foreign banks deemed too big to fail, except when the home government designates them as such. Um, we also found that the French financial institution targeted obligation resulting from the FATCA law against tax fraud or um, collateral requirement for reinsurers. And uh, during the TISA negotiation, uh, the trade union UNI exposed also how Insurance Europe asked the removal of localization requirement, including the obligation to establish a commercial presence in a specific legal form. Then another thing to have in mind is that the EU is not always the best in class regarding financial regulation. On several issues, the EU has often a stronger regulation than its main trade partners, and the trade policy might result as a way to foster a race to the bottom, which weaken the EU rules. But in the financial sector, the EU financial regulation is not always better than the one of its trade partners. So the, the EU and its financial industry have a clear responsibility here in the current race to the bottom. We could see during the TTIP negotiation, despite Europe's insistence, the U, that the US uh, were clearly um, reluctant to include financial matters in regulatory cooperation. The former Treasury Secretary Jack Liu uh, declared he was against the inclusion of financial matters in regulatory cooperation on several occasions. He said, for instance, normally in a trade agreement, the pressure is to lower standards on things like financial regulation or environmental regulation. And the United States will not allow this agreement to serve as an opportunity to water down domestic financial regulatory standards or dilute the impact of the step that we have taken to safeguard the US economy. Of course, should uh, negotiation resume, the American position could evolve given the new Trump's administration proclivity for financial deregulation. Uh, in the CETA discussion, we could also observe that the small improvement in the safeguard clauses that have been introduced were clearly at the request of the Canadian regulators rather than the EU. And then I will not go into detail uh, about all the shortcomings of the EU trade policy, unless you have a specific question. But uh, all that has been said regarding the lack of transparency and the lack of consultation of EU and national members of parliament uh, and civil society uh, applies also here. So in its own report, the EU parliament acknowledged that it has limited access to the document uh, of the negotiations. So this means in practice that many people with valuable expertise on financial regulation are kept out the negotiation and can only assess the deal when it is almost finalized and impossible to, to change. So now if we look closer uh, at the text of this agreement, why, um, what, what is problematic? Concretely, this agreement deepened financial liberalization in a very intrusive way. In CETA and in GIFTA, the negotiation method used were a negative list. So uh, this was the first time for the EU. And this means that all financial services uh, that are not explicitly listed as being excluded from the agreement are by default open to competition. So we, we also say that this is a list it or lose it approach. Um, and uh, as a note published by uh, BNP Paribas, the French bank um, said, this approach is risky as government are in fact taking commitment in sectors that do not yet exist. Secondly, uh, in this agreement, states accept to limit their ability to regulate. So they, they take commitment um, uh, in uh, the, the provision called mark, market access rule and performance requirement that uh, restrict domestic regulation. And um, this uh, provision contain numerous restrictions on regulation and could therefore uh, prohibit measures that seek to limit the size of bank, 
uh, or to regulate harmful activities such as high um, frequency trading or food price speculation. Uh, they also could prevent uh, measure to struggle um, money laundering or tax evasion uh, or to, to maintain data localization rule. And they force to financial innovation. So they limit the regulation of new financial services. And this could facilitate the proliferation of poorly controlled toxic products. Then the intended regulatory cooperation mechanism will also increase the influence of financial lobby against public interest. You may have heard that these new agreements are living agreements. So once adopted, they can be enlarged through the mechanism of regulatory cooperation. This means that they put in place several technical level dialogues designed to promote the convergence of both parties' regulation. Before the drafting of any law, the EU member state or the European Union must inform the Canadian trading partner and vice versa and consult it in order to come to consider the comment. And the private sector can be involved in this process. So the most controversial aspects might be put on hold during the negotiations and that at a later stage, with less democratic oversight. This offers new lobbying opportunities to representatives of the financial sector. And this is clearly assumed by some former members of the negotiation team. For instance, you can see on the screen, David Plunkett, who was um, former Canadian ambassador to the EU and member of the CETA negotiation team. Uh, and he co-founded uh, the, the Canada EU Trade Investment Association. And he says that CETA for the first time includes a standalone chapter on regulatory cooperation that provides Canadian business with opportunities to get early insight into what government may be planning and doing. And the president of this association, Mark Camieri, said also that this regulatory cooperation institutionalizes the opportunity for Canadian business to take full advantage of CETA by having a role in EU decision making. Um, so this is uh, why um, the, the real impact of this agreement therefore risks moving beyond what was in, in initially intended. And finally, The EU intends to include in all its bilateral agreement investment protection chapters that increase the rights of investors, including in the financial sector. And uh, those chapters offer the opportunity for financial institutions to sue the EU or its member states through the investor state dispute settlement mechanism. Such mechanism will cover financial sector with a broad definition of its investment, including bonds and portfolio investments. So this means that investor will be able to challenge financial regulation or even just threaten to do it when there are projects of regulation uh, that uh, are going uh, against their own interest and exposed to such kind of legal challenges and uh, financial uh, consequences, states might dilute or simply give up uh, to take measure deemed as necessary to maintain financial stability in the future. So the inclusion uh, of this mechanism, again, has been strongly requested by financial institution. You can see on the screen uh, that Goldman Sachs managing director uh, told to the former US trade representative, Michael Froman, uh, that um, he wanted to underscore how important it was for the financial services industry to get robust commitment on the ISDS in the TTIP agreement. Um, and uh, for instance, Insurance Europe uh, also was asking a transparent investor state resolution mechanism in TISA. And it should be observed that these new rights are not balanced at all by any duty for investors regarding the impact of their activity on society and on the environment. So for its part, the EC pretends 
that financial regulation is protected through safeguard clauses called prudential carve-out. These clauses stipulate that signatory countries can preserve the right to introduce any prudential measure they deem necessary. But these clauses, oh, sorry. These clauses are incomplete, and many of them don't go further than in the GATS, uh, the agreement uh, I mentioned uh, in the World Trade Organization. And the condition, um, and they, they set also condition for invoking this safeguard, which, which uh, strongly limits uh, its scope. For instance, agreement generally stipulates that prudential measures should not be more burdensome than necessary. So this necessity test gives significant interpretive leeway to the arbitrators, which would be called upon to settle dispute between states or between state and in, in investors. And last but not least, uh, restriction on capital movement are also completely outdated. Uh, as uh, the um, academic uh, Danny Rodrick uh, notes, paradoxically, capital account liberalization became a norm in trade agreement just uh, as professional opinion among economists was becoming more skeptical about the wisdom of free capital flows. So even international organizations like the IMF uh, have changed their approach and recognize now that capital control measures can be useful when other tools for settling macroeconomic or financial imbalances are not available. But this trend has not caught up with trade policy. Uh, and trade negotiation. So just like GATS in the 1990s, trade agreement under preparation continue to limit government leeway in this domain. And they provide only for temporary and reactive recourse to such policies, which is not enough to guarantee genuine financial stability. So in conclusion, uh, we can see that a detailed analysis of CETA, GIFTA, TTIP draft, and TISA draft confirm that this agreement will most probably contribute to the emergence or the spread of new financial crises, and even worse, they will weaken states' ability to adopt regulation that fight financial instability and promote the ecological and transition uh, of our economies. And Brexit negotiation could raise similar problem if CETA serves as a model as it is intended. So this is why the Vivalent Institute and Finance Watch make the following recommendation. First, ensure transparency and proper democratic control of a trade agreement. Second, exclude financial regulation from trade negotiations. Third, rule out the use of the investor state dispute settlement mechanism. Stop using the negative list method to grant market access for services. Ensure that public services and social security system are explicitly protected. Protect also the ability of states to regulate efficiently. Include a clause in trade agreements to allow states to put in place effective checks on movement of capital when deemed necessary and make trade and services agreement reversible. Um, I leave it here for now. Uh, I hope it was clear enough. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I'm of course available to answer any questions.